So please welcome our panelists up and um, thank them for coming. Between the two ladies, mm -hmm. keep me in check. <laughs> so there wasn't much planned. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want to do opening or shall I? Or something? Well, I had a plan. Yes. There was an opening. Yes. All right. You can see this is well planned as all of our activities in Indian country are always well planned. <laughs> And then sometimes they actually happen. Mishi Stui. And I didn't really want to start off because I'm in the midst of all these amazing warrior women. So I literally was just going to fetch water, which I've already done, so I'm kind of done for the day. Um, <laughs> but I want, did want to offer a song. Um, I'm Greg Castro, and I'm Totral Slinen, and uh, Rumson, and Ramatushaloni. Um, I've been working with the uh, Ramatush uh, Association, the Tribal Council, uh, who are the indigenous peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula for a couple of years now, and just recently was appointed as the principal uh, tribal consultant to the tribal chair. And all that fancy word means is that uh, I'm here to acknowledge that this is Ramatush land. Um, and that's why I'm honored and, and deeply uh, humbled to be here. And what I have to offer to start off, and then I'll let these people do all the talking, um, is a, a song that I often start off with. It, I learned it from uh, my cousin, Linda Umani. Uh, it's uh, from Runson Land down in Monterey, who have something very similar to San Francisco, which is fog. And so it's the fog song. And I often sing it when I do presentations, because I think in addition to the physical fog, which we don't have much today, but we all always come into a setting often with fog in our own hearts and in our own minds. And that includes me too, because I always come to this setting thinking I'm going to learn, not just teach or talk at people, but I'm going to get something. That's why I often do this. So I want to clear the fog out of my own mind, and I'm willing to share that song with everybody else, and hopefully they'll clear some things out too. So this is a ceremonial song, uh, not a ceremonial song, so you don't have to stand. Arapa Chitil Juan, Wasia Hiem. 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 Arapa Chitil Juan. Wasia him, Arapa Chitia Juan, Wasia him. Oh. I always teach our kids that uh, the so fog song is very powerful. Um, they sing the song and then they look up and see if the fog's gone. If it's not gone, they keep on singing it. And it always works. And usually it's not until you're old enough to have your own kids teach them that you finally figure out what they really meant. Oh. It's a way to keep the kids occupied, because sometimes the fog lasts all day. So, hopefully, it won't today. I'd spend a gun. Thank you. Okay. Am I up? Is on? Yes. Is it on now? Yep. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I'm the traditional spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan, which is in the East Bay uh, on the other side. I have had the honor and blessing to be born and raised in my home territory um, with an unbroken tie for since the beginning of time. My children and my grandchildren are born there and um, and so we have this blessing of being on our lands all the time. 
I am thankful for being here um, as a guest on the Ramatusha Ohlone Territory. Um, thankful for Greg for offering that song for us to begin. Thankful to our sister, uh, Professor Joanne Barker, for uh, honoring us and bringing us here to talk about uh, land acknowledgement, which is really a great uh, opportunity to speak to students and community members about what that actually means. I'm really humbled and honored to be here in the presence of our elder uh, professor, Lanita Warjack, who has um, laid down the foundation of many of the struggles that we have as an American Indian people in general, and so thankful for the work that she's done. And so the work that I have done in my lifetime has been on the backs of my elders, um, and I think that that's important for us to see. I had the opportunity to be on Sacred Facebook the other night. <laughs> And on Sacred Facebook, my one of my warrior sisters, who is Kanaka Maui from, um, from Hawaii, was writing a story um, and venting. And in the story, she was venting about how frustrated she was with the uh, younger generation and how she had been arrested multiple times and the, the work that she had done over the last three or four decades. And to be pushed out along the line uh, away from the uh, a massive uh, gathering of people that happened last weekend um, because people didn't know who she was. And so I think it's always important for us to remember our traditional teachings of remembering who our elders are and the work that has come before us. And so I just wanted to say that. I want to say thank you to Greg for the work, the immense work that he's done over years of trying to uh, protect and preserve our sacred sites as well as um, um, being a voice. And for Canyon, who um, is everywhere, um, <laughs> doing as much as she can because she has much more energy than we do right now. <laughs> okay. With all of that, my friend... Um, you know, talks about these protocols that happen, and the protocols have to happen in this way when we acknowledge the people that come before us, and that's part of the land acknowledgement as well. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in our territories, and it's a double-edged sword. You know, this morning I woke up to text messages from friends in Berkeley talking about a sacred site of ours being destroyed as she's going to work on Amtrak. Um, last, oh, two weeks ago, I got a phone call from, uh, and an email from developers that are, um, pulling up my ancestral remains because they're going to do a development there for housing. We've been in a battle for three years to save the oldest village site on the shores at the West Berkeley Shell Mound. And these are things that folks coming into our territories never have to deal with. And so it has been really in the last, I want to say the last 20, 25 years really, that people even knew that Ohlone people, the generic term for us, even exist still. It has been because of our dedication to the sacred that has actually allowed people to see us again. It has been kind of, of allies and accomplices doing the work with us that people see us again. It has been kind of, of the prayers we laid down to our ancestors remembering them so that they could remember us. That allows us to be in this room together with you today. I um, I'm always humbled and amazed when I wake up to realize that my ancestors, our ancestors collectively lived through three waves of genocide and that it is a miracle that we are still here. The language that I spoke in is Chochenyo, the language of the East Bay. My great grandfather, Jose Guzman, was one of the last speakers of that language. And so my daughter, is learning that language and teaching my grandchildren and other tribal members, and it has been asleep, but it is waking back up. And I believe that as because of my ancestors. So we're here to talk about land acknowledgement, and I think that this is interesting because I've been getting tons of emails, and maybe you guys have been too, 
about what should we say. Mm -hmm. We want to acknowledge the land all of a sudden. Well, that's interesting. For me, it's like, oh, okay. And at first, you know, people were asking over the last couple of years, Karina, can you come and do a land acknowledgement? Can you come and bless the land? Can you come and open up for an event that we're doing? And I thought, wow, this is amazing and wonderful. And um, and yes, because we haven't been seen in a long time. And then as I settled into all the immense work that has to happen, I began to say, you know, Maybe the best way to do this is to actually bring us to the table as partners in the work that you're doing. You want us to welcome you onto this land, and there was an ethnic studies conference that happened in Oakland, mm, I want to say five or six years ago. And we were at the first congregational church in Oakland, and um, I was asked to come and do an opening before Chief Winneman went to um, Kelly Sisk and Angela Davis, and there was one other person on the panel. Um, and so when I sat, I, I went up to do the welcoming, I reminded people that that was interesting for me to welcome people onto my land when I didn't know who you were. Because when you welcome someone onto your land, there is a reciprocity. There is a, uh, what my, what uh, Dr. Fui Fui Lupe says, it talks about a va. It's about creating this relationship. This relationship between each other and what does that mean? There's a story that I was told about when people would come to our territories, that they would stop at the edge of our territories because people knew who was in charge of which land, which water people were obligated to, whose mountain people were obligated to. And they would stop at the edge of that land and they would light a smoke fire and they would wait until someone came and got them. And in waiting for someone to come and get them, other people would stay in the village and they would gather foods and gifts and get ready for gambling and story. And they would bring that person to the village and they would be welcomed with food and they would get, be gifted and they would be gambling games and there would be dancing. And then finally they would ask them, why do you want to be in this territory? And sometimes it was because they wanted to cross to the other side. Maybe they just wanted to come and visit relatives. Maybe they needed to pick medicine or to gather something else. Or maybe they had a message to bring but it was after all of the protocols that would happen. Today, we go across to many different territories whenever we get in our car or on a plane or on a bus and never acknowledge the thousands of ancestors that were there and whose territory we're on because we have no relationship. Land acknowledgement must begin with a relationship with the people on whose land you're on. We can say words, like many universities right now, you see systems and other places are looking for the words. Give me the words that I can say at the beginning of each meeting, at the beginning of each graduation. Corporations, tell us the words that we're supposed to say to acknowledge your ancestors. But are those corporations or universities or community centers doing work with the original people of the lands? And that's where it comes, for me, the deepest meaning is to really acknowledge that you are on someone else's homeland. When I talk to fourth graders, I say, hey, when you go to your best friend's house, how do you behave yourself? And they'll say, well, we say thank you and please. We don't break people's stuff. We ask. We don't rummage through the refrigerator, right? Those are things as adults that we teach our children and our grandchildren. But as adults, do we do the same thing when we come to someone's territory? Because you're in someone else's home. Do we continue to say thank you and please? Do we not break things? Do we take care of things like they're our own or better? And so land acknowledgement comes with all of those things as well for me. 
So I think that we've grown in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years when nobody knew us at all, that people are coming to us looking for guidance about what those words could be. And I think the next step I'm looking for is how do we now live in reciprocity with one another on our homelands? No one is going home. This is becoming other folks' home as well. We want to be good hosts, and we need good guests. And so when I look at land acknowledgement today, I want to say, yes, I want to create those words. I want us to remember the genocide that happened on these lands. I want us to remember how people are now coming to our lands looking for a home. I want us to remember that we, as human beings, need to see each other as human beings again. I want us to remember that 200 years ago, in any of our territories, there was no such thing as homelessness, there was no such thing as hunger, and every creek in our territories you could drink fresh water out of. Our songs are about abundance, and there is an abundance here. The Bay Area is full of magic because I believe our ancestors prayed for us for thousands of years and put that magic in this land. There are things that are grown here, ideas and movements that are grown nowhere else in the world. And I believe that we need to have that reciprocity with the land as well. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Mishmin Tuhis, Conracott Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. <laughs> I come from Indian Canyon Nation. I am the daughter of tribal chairwoman Anne Marie Sayers of the Indian Canyon Mutsun Band of Coast and Ohlone people. I identify as an Ohlone California native or Coast and Owen Ohlone Mutsun, of which two of those terms are misnomers. Coast and Owen is what the Spaniards called us. Ohlone is a common term that some of the original peoples of the Bay Area identify with. I proudly identify as an Alani person. However, I do recognize that some of my cousins do not identify with that term. I am Mutsun. That is the language of my ancestors. And I introduce myself. Um, Khan Rakat, my name is. And I recognize that I am a very privileged California indigenous woman who's able to say that she has been born and raised on the land of her ancestors where my grandmothers, 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 grandmothers have always been from. I'm very privileged and lucky and blessed to have been raised in a traditional and intertribal community space where I have witnessed many culture sharing opportunities with California indigenous community members, intertribal and international visitors. And so calling that home, having been raised off the grid in Indian Canyon, which is the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along central coastal California. That being said, we have Great and Rancheria, federally recognized people, federally recognized lands down towards Santa Barbara, San Inez, uh, Rancheria, federally recognized people, federally recognized land. Indian Canyon is a tiny trust allotment that President Taft identified my great grandfather, great, great grandfather, uh, as an indigenous person. So we have federally recognized Indian country, land, and we consider ourselves a sovereign community. However, no tribal recognition, no help, no perks, no anything like that. I see the pros and cons of that whole federal recognition process. I try to avoid some of those conversations. Uh, <clears throat> but I recognize that that is the home of my ancestors. And having been raised there, I see how lucky and privileged I am. And I recognize that I was always on what we acknowledge as indigenous protocol, those respect that respectful etiquette, similarly to how we visit our neighbor and we knock on a door. Well, if we don't have a lot of doors and fences, how do you come to the edge? And so I was always on the receiving end, always seeing people bring gifts and seek consensual respectful relations with my mother and then find out if it's okay to continue talking and progressing towards a conversation or a potential opportunity to uh, 
uh, have ceremony on the land or wherever they may need my mother's help or our community to come together. So being on that receiving end uh, and witnessing that as a normal occurrence, I recognize how unique that is. And then as I travel around the Bay, I am always learning. I have stumbled and I'm always growing. I do not, like even today, in recognizing that here we are in San Francisco, or what I would say is here we are in Yolamu, in Ramatush Ohlone territory. And whenever I attempt to travel the Bay, I try and learn more. So I'm, I don't talk the same way as I do two years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so in that we grow and it's how we walk forward with this new information. And then I, because I am so young and exuberant and supposedly have this abundant energy. (laughs) Could you believe at 17 and 19 and 22, I was an introvert? Yeah, it it, it was true. And I learned to synthesize social energies. So I've shifted how I uh, engage in the public and because I have uh, a nice indigenous singing voice, I can't read music and I can't keep a tune with other songs, but a nice indigenous singing voice, my mother pushed me because she said she can't sing. And uh, she, she and my grandmother have always taught and shared that when ceremony, singing and dancing stops, so does the earth. And my mother participates in ceremony And there are so many dances that happen on our land and in spaces that we go to. And because she's like, and now my amazing daughter can sing. My mother could sing. I don't know where it went for me, but she would always push me. So around 15, she would push me in front and and get me to sing. So my mother would do the land acknowledgement and acknowledge the space and attempt to do her best in honoring the ancestors of the territories that she visits and then she would have me sing and and from those opportunities and uh extra oomph i've gotten a cha- many chances to go into many spaces and from there being of assistance to my mother in areas where uh sometimes she would want to talk about different things and she would share things, and I'd be like, oh, and don't forget that. Oh, and don't forget that. She goes, oh, well, is there something you have to say? <laughs> I'm just like, no, these are all the things that you say. I just wanted to make sure that it came up. And so from there, she gave me more opportunities to speak. And then she likes to, she likes to point out San Francisco State University. One of the days, I can't remember if she wasn't feeling well or if she had something. She had San Francisco State University as a field trip. And she pushed me to go and welcome them. And and she came down and she heard what I had shared. She's like, she's taking all my lines. (laughs) (laughs) And so when coming into these spaces, I'd I'd make sure she had priority of everything she wanted to share and then I'd fill in the gaps. And from there I learned that a lot of what I was raised with is not familiar. So how best do I offer myself as a resource or someone who can inspire or instigate or be a catalyst to start these conversations. And I understand that my elders and some of my community members or some community members would say, I don't need to tell them this because they should know. And I understand that. And I'm sitting here like, but how will they know if they don't know? And then how do we get these conversations to happen? And so I at times see myself as some of that in-between. So (laughs) the way Karina perfectly lined it up saying, um, my abundant energy and do what I can, I always say I will do what I can, when I can, where I can, wherever I can, to do my best to honor my ancestors, to honor truth and history, and to be a good ancestor in training. And from that, I uh, am blessed to have amazing mentors. And I have learned a lot from allies, so much. And I recognize that we're all impacted by colonization, that if we recognize that if we honor our ancestors and honor truth and history, we learn that all of our ancestors have indigenous lineages from the land that they come from. And then in that, recognizing indigenous protocol, who are the ancestors and who are the communities who have always been stewarding the lands that we are present at? And how can we be good guests? And so recognizing that colonization is a mentality. So we can heal from that. We could work on that. We can grow from that. 
and I'm ever inspired by who I encounter and what I encounter. So from the work that I do with the Roaming Ohlone <laughs> to uh, utilizing my graphic design skills to create a mini zine about acknowledging native lands here in the Bay Area and um, methods of allyship or guidelines and practices that are always ever developing and bringing in more perspectives of community members and being diligent to respect individual protocols but try and give a quick little sense of here's some guidelines, here's some little bits that can be helpful in a journey to connect with community and connect and bond with truth and history. And so I am just really lucky to see my community members like Melissa Nelson and Lenata Warjack and Karina and Greg and so many other beings. I see them as my superstars. They are my role models. And there's something to be said that when your role models are attainable and when you get a chance to interact with them and they see you, it feels so much better than idolizing a potential celebrity that you may or may not get a chance to encounter. When you have someone who you respect and who is a role model and then they see you, there's something very powerful with that. So I would love to also share space with Greg and then a little bit more in a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this whole thing was well planned. Um, for, amongst us, we got together five seconds before we got up here mm. and uh -huh. decided what we're going to do. Best way to do it. Um, one thing, just in listening to these two talk about their their experience, uh, it, it occurred to me something that I, you know, spent several years doing is uh, working uh, as a consultant and instructing various government agencies at different levels, particularly with state parks, on how to consult with native communities. And the first thing I tell them when I when I come up to the front of the room, I says, forget everything you know. Because what you, what you know is what you think you know, and it's probably wrong. And the next thing I usually tell them is that what we're going to talk about today, and hopefully it's interactive, is that uh, trying to describe native concepts in English, and those particularly working on any language, as uh, we are up here at any level, will tell you that English sucks. That's a technical description. You can, you can put that in your dissertations if you like. <laughs> Don't know what the grade's going to be, but... And, and I think part of that is, you know, the, the, when you were saying, talking about the word land acknowledgement, right, that's actually relatively recent because we used to do welcomings mm. to people who were already here, by the way. Mm. So... Um, and then blessings was the other one. That's even harder, considering our history. So, so recently, somebody asked me about that. She says, you know, we, they used, used to, used of the word welcoming or blessing, and they heard me say, you know, uh, to put it down as a land acknowledgement, that I was asked to, to open something up. And I said, well, you can just, if, if you know, I said land acknowledgement, what we do. He says, well, what that's a, what's that about? It says just like acknowledging the place you're from, that you're on, and who was there before you. And I think they went to one of the places that I suggested this was a little, still a little confused, so they said opening. They just said opening. Mm. So I was part of the opening. <laughs> so w this word of land acknowledgement to me is very businesslike. And that's one of the other things I talked about to government agencies. I said, you come to us and ask for your consultation to check off that box. And for us, it's not business. It's personal, it's intimate, it's deeply moving to us in a way that we don't see with other people in their own lives, let alone in what they think they know about our lives. Because what most Americans, to use that phrase, know about their history is an immense 500 years, right? You know, Crest got lost about 525 years ago and bumped into an island. And, it, and then the Europeans found out about us and started to come. 
And that's what they call history. And for us, that was like last week. Hmm. Because we've been here since time immemorial. We use that term, the dawn of time. Our, most of our stories talk about us being here when the world was made the way we see it now. And we were brought in to take care of it. And archaeologically, that's more than now 15,000 years. And that number that keeps moving. Because when I started working on site protection and, and uh, archaeology in the early 90s, it was like 8,000 years. And if you said a five-digit word, five yeah, years. yeah, if you said 10,000 years, oh, you, you're a radical. <laughs> Bearing straight theory. Yeah. And of course now, just, just within the last month, they've talked about a documented site up by Seattle, I believe, that's at 16,600 years. And that's the officially accepted amongst the archaeological community number. And then you have all the other crazies who are even further along, including a group of archaeologists saying 130,000 at in San Diego. And my elders would say, well, they're getting closer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're getting closer. They'll catch up eventually. Yes, yes, it's Western science. It's part of their business plan. And for us, it's not business. So what does it mean for me to be land acknowledging land? Well, I did my song with this. This is the most common of our musical instruments in California. It's a clapper stick. And they're generally made out of elderberry. In my dad's uh, community, the Slynn community, South Ohlone, our origin stories say we are made from elderberry. So we're made from the very thing from the earth we came from. And we have a more than 15,000 years at least bond with that place. So to say land acknowledgement doesn't begin to describe our relationship with that place we came from. It is a deeply intimate connection Last night I was asked at the last minute to do a pitch for a grant that's going to work with some Maloney people to do some cultural things in the public in San Jose. And so I had to write something at the last minute. And uh, I talked about, uh, imagine having an intimate relationship with a play, with the place of your birth. And most people think of their mother as the place of their birth mm -hmm. with an umbilical cord. And then imagine that umbilical cord being ripped off while you still need it. And then imagine and having to be in that place since that time and feel that loss every single day and trying to reestablish, renew it, keep it going in the midst of the chaos of the newcomers, many of whom themselves are ripped from their own homelands and had their own umbilical cords ripped and dealing with that trauma. And then one elder who told me, he says, and they're taking it out on us. Another elder said, well, they got kicked out of their paradise. That's what their Bible tells them. So they're trying to come and kick us out of ours. But we ain't leaving. So land acknowledgement like many of the concepts we talk about, are, is really awkward to say in English. Even for those of us who don't know a lot of our language, but we know our language did a lot better job of, deci of describing that intimate, deep, personal connection that we have. That we're now going to come out in front of a bunch of people and say, yeah, you're on Yulamo. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Have a nice convention which is what it usually winds up being. And we're gonna, we will do that, because we need to, because that's start of the process. Because, before, you know, like Karina said, you know, it wasn't that long ago where they didn't even know couldn't, what a loney was. Or if they did, they were well, all those extinct people that used to be here. <laughs> and I, I remember that story. And then when I met Canyon, she was in first grade, I think. 
<laughs> and she talked about coming from her school growing up and hearing that same story, that coming home to Anne and Anne Marie and saying, Mom, they said I'm extinct. If you're Indian, you're dead. <laughs> quote, end yeah. quote. Yes. So now we get to do land acknowledgments, though. This is, well, we're sort of here. <laughs> so I guess that's progress. Thank you. Button. Is that, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for acknowledging uh, all of us and bringing forth the information on land acknowledgement. I think it's extremely valuable to learn what we just learned today, don't you think? I mean, how many of us knew that? I mean, I, I knew some, but I didn't know as described in the way that, say, Karina talked about visiting a home and how a child acts within that home. And that just really brings it so clearly that we, that is something you can remember, that all of us can remember. I really appreciate uh, having this information and for bringing it to the nation as well, because all of the tribes are starting that now, and it started from here. Mm. And so it was really good uh, what you had to say about the magic in California. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to think so. We're a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of the tribes now are finally getting to that point, like... Just in Idaho, within the last month, we had uh, situations where we had to go to a town that their logo was the Redskins, mm. and so we, we had to talk to them about that, and no one knew anything about protocol or land acknowledgement. Mm. Uh, to even bring it up or talk about it. And, of course, I had to try to do what little I could to talk about it, but I wasn't one of the official speakers. I just had to try to jump in and get a few words <laughs> in edgewise. But <clears throat> it's real important in, in all of the towns and the cities and where we live to have that land acknowledgement and of course, with Indigenous Peoples Day coming up, it's it's very important. So I just wanted to make a few comments and thank you for bringing this information to us because it's it's very important, and especially considering that we're all still alive, oh. we're still here. <laughs> you know, my my dad always said that people will try to destroy an ant hill, you know, kick it or burn it or do all kinds of harmful things. And I don't know why they do that, but they do that. And then there'll be these few little ants crawling away. And he says, that's who we are. Mm. That's what we came through. Mm. So thank you. Mm. It was very helpful and inspirational for all of us, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.